if you can believe it, uh, we are at episode 24. Uh, it, it, could you imagine this next week these students are arriving and they're going to arrive uh, in episode 25? Imagine uh, skipping out on 24 previous episodes. That'll teach them, right? Uh, but, you know, I always have to strategize how do I introduce a, a new student body to a series if they haven't been following it. But this is a very unique series. I, I've done series that, that have been historically based, but I don't know how to liken this one to any of those. You know, my World War I and my World War II series were chronological like this one is, but this one doesn't have the exact storyline that you would know to follow. And I'm trying to deal with things, of course, that are standing out to my soul that are deeply spiritual in the formation of our country in a period of time between 1914 and 1974. It's a 60-year period between World War I and Watergate that is highly defining of the world in which we live today. And so, so much of the world we live in today had its root system established there. Now, you could argue that some of the racial things that are happening, well, that's gonna go way back in early America. And I agree with that. And you could, you could argue that about anything. You know, the, uh, the Marxism, the Leninism, the uh, Stalinism, the communism that is going to flow out of this. Yeah, its root system is going to be back before this. You could even tag Darwin for some of these things. And yet there's something in the activities and the actions and the decisions of this time period which are deeply defining. And yet my interest isn't just to teach history, even though I'm always fascinated by history. It's to learn from history. It's to extract from history the spiritual lessons that impact our individual lives and our lives as the church of Jesus Christ. I want to actively engage with the truth and not just passively look on and you know, either sneer or shake my head and wonder. I want to live abundantly for Jesus. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that more abundant. I choose to be on that side. I want to be one who is giving life and that more abundant. And so even through these messages, even though some of them go through some dark territory, I want the outflow to be life and that more abundant. That's, that's the end goal of all truth. It's not to diminish, it's not to dash hope, it's not to discourage and to depress, it's to bring life and joy, a leap. So let's see if we can get that leap today. Uh, Operation Snow Job. So I had, uh, the, the operation, it's actually a, an operation of Soviet Russia in America. Uh, it's going to be during the early 40s, during World War II, uh, and it's going, its impact is going to be felt even to this day. But it was called Operation Snow, and I'm calling it Operation Snow Job, which means to pull the wool over someone's eyes or to you know, pull the roost or the con, and that's exactly what this is. But Operation Snow Job is being pulled against us constantly. The enemy is always up to the con in our life, to bait us, to mislead us, to misdirect us, to distract us. That's his job description, if you will. It's very similar to what we're going to see happening against America in this same time period that we're in. If you're trying to figure out where we're at because you've missed all previous episodes, we are in the late 1940s right now, which is the last place I landed my feet uh, squarely. And yet some of this is going to go through the early 1940s and sort of catch us up to basically where we're going to be in the 1950s when this Red Scare is going to be in full motion. The concern about communist infiltration into our country. It's going to be a very defining thing to the 1950s, early 1960s, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is going to be happening. That is direct uh, impact from these uh, events. So Operation Snow Job, I almost called this uh, Mr. Stalin for president. Uh, I, had, I had various names. Uh, the Stalin Sabotage, uh, the, uh, what was it? Uh, Mr. Sneaky Von Sneakerson. Uh, that was one of my titles. I almost went with that one. I thought that one sounded fun. And then I was going to have a picture of Joseph Stalin come up. Yeah, here's Sneaky Von Sneakerson uh, right here. Uh, these guys are really good at their job, I have to admit. Uh, just like I'd say the devil, I don't like to give the devil compliments, but he's really good at what he does. He's a good deceiver. That doesn't mean I like the fact that he deceives. I'm just going to say, hey, when a compliment's due, a compliment's due, right? He's good at deceiving. He's Sneaky Von Sneakerson. I didn't think that a German name would, have, would be fitting for Joseph Stalin, so I also didn't choose it for that reason. Operation Snow Job, when the wool is pulled over our eyes. So 
I'm going to not go into the storyline just yet. I, I want to talk in general first of how the enemy misleads us. And I could talk about this in so many different regards. And I'm just going to give a few examples just to sort of show that even in the, what we could call the healthy church model, we can easily get off course. And we can put emphasis in places that are not wrong, but it's an overemphasis. It's, it's like too big of a font size or... It's, it's too much uh, highlighter pen on something that isn't supposed to have that much highlighter pen. So when dangerous counselors are allowed to remain, they will always end up leading you into crisis. If you have something in your life that God convicts you of and says, you know what, maybe we should lift that out, and you don't heed that, it would be considered a dangerous counselor. It is something that you're allowing to remain, and when you allow that to remain, that little voice that you have allowed to stay there will end up leading you over a cliff. It's just a principle of life. When the Spirit of God is leading you and correcting you, follow it, heed it. So dangerous counselors in the church today that subtly or not so subtly steer us off course and over a cliff. So this isn't one that is common today, even though there is a, a Hebrew roots movement that has definitely been present in the church, but this is one that you could say is back 2,000 years ago. Paul, the Hebrew of Hebrews, the eighth day circumcised, pure-blooded, certifiably Hebrew, church-persecuting, legally spotless, pharisaical ben Benjamite. It's like he has everything going for him, guys. I mean, this is, this is the real deal. And so it's easy for Paul to put his confidence in his list of accomplishments than in the shed blood of Jesus. And that is misleading to his soul. It is an evil counselor that is speaking something that sounds very true. That if you could be the Hebrew of Hebrews, hey, you're fine just right there. You're of the lineage of Abraham. You're set. When in actuality, Jesus is going to come in and say, that actually isn't what saves you. And he's the eighth day circumcised. I mean, how many people in this world have been circumcised on the eighth day? I mean, come on. There's only a select group of us that, ever, that have that to brag about. And yet that isn't his salvation. If he starts putting his confidence in that, it is going to mislead him. Pure-blooded, certifiably Hebrew, church-persecuting, legally spotless, pharisaical Benjamite. What a list. This guy's the ultimate Jew. Or is he? And see, there's a subtle counselor that's gotten in, and it's called self-righteousness. It's called legalism. And when that gets into the mix, it actually can lead someone away from the truth, even though the whole while they're being led away, they think they're walking in righteousness. Are you the card-carrying Republican? The Trump-loving, pro-life, voting, small government supporting, caucus-following, never-miss-the-vote Reaganite. It's like some of you are like, oh, now that's a human right there. Now that's something God can esteem. And I would say there's, I don't want to make a comment one way or the other, and if that's a good thing or not, could you imagine I could spike the punch really quick on that one? However, that isn't what saves you. This isn't what alters your soul. You could be all of those things and be very unhealthy in your spiritual life. It does not mean things are wrong. I mean, there's some good things in that list, right? And yet, if you put your confidence like, hey, I'm righteous because of this, you are misled. Are you the plainly accoutred minimalist, the pacifist, head-covered, long-dressed, simple fabric, horse-drawn, carriage-riding Anabaptist? Hey, guys, uh, what I'm saying, even though some of you are like, why would I think that would be uh, righteousness? There's a whole sector of the church that actually feels more righteous because of certain behaviors externally, and they put confidence in that, and that is a misleading counselor. It does not mean there can't be wisdom in some of these things. Are you the I-dotting, T-crossing moralist, the alcohol-abstaining, cigarette-resisting, non-swearing, purity-keeping, below-the-kneecap dress-wearing, always-punctual rule-keeper? Now, some of you, you know, you, there's going to be different lists where you can mock them and go, oh, that's ridiculous. And there's other ones that are like, well, what's wrong with that list? And all I'm saying is anything we put our confidence in outside the shed blood of Jesus and the righteousness of Jesus can mislead us into thinking this is why God loves us and this is why God accepts us. Are you the doctrinally sound theologian? Are you the biblically groomed, eschatologically astute, soteriologically refined, hermeneutically polished doctrinarian? And some people are like, yes, I am. And so some people would actually default to the fact that they know their doctrine so well that God must approve them. When I would say there are a lot of sound doctrined people out there that are very unhealthy in their soul. 
And so we need to recognize that the enemy has a counseling system that can oftentimes be based on partial truths that if we don't recognize what is taking place in our soul, we can be led astray. So these dupers, I'm calling all of those things dupers, are good, and we are pretty good at being dupes. So I'm going to give you another list, the dangerous self-counselors in our inner life, and just ponder how this can easily work. For instance, self-analysis. Well, what's wrong with that? Uh, is something wrong with me? Is something, going to be, is something going to be wrong with me? Is this spot cancer? Am I really saved? I mean, these are just questions, harmless questions, and that these questions can eat away like a rat on cheese in our soul. And we can become fixated in self-examination, and it misleads us from the point of actually God analysis. We're supposed to be focused on him and his word, his truth. That's what our soul is supposed to be studying, not looking inward and getting caught. Self-help. How can I make my life better? How can I be happier? How can I be more financially stable? How can I be healthier, stronger, more beautiful? These are baits for the soul that all have the ring of truth to them. And yet, if you get caught in them, they're a net, and they can easily begin to mislead and steer your soul away from Jesus Christ. Self-absorption. You wake up in the morning, and one of the number one things an American is going to think is, what do I want today? Just in and of itself, just circle that and say, guys, what is that? Because that is the exact opposite of Christianity. What does Christ want today? Have you ever thought about that question? That's Christianity. I am more important than them. I need time for me. These ideas are counselors, especially in this, the zeitgeist or the spirit of the age in which we live. We are very susceptible to them. Self-pleasure, the I must feel good fetish. Intellectual fetish, understanding complex things, or informational fetish, constantly having something to chew on. There are different things that get different people. And some of those, you're like, I'm not struggling with that. And yet other people, they have to have information. They have to have news. They have to have the TV on. They need to feel connected. They, remember FOMO, fear of missing out? They, they have whatever that is. And it's a dangerous counselor to their soul. Like, you need this. Do you? You see, the key is that we are counseled by the Spirit of God, the Word of God, the Word of truth, and that we are not allowing any other counselor to steer us away from the clear calling that we've received. So I'm going to call these guys biblical dupers, and they have names, and they show up in the book of Nehemiah, and they're very fascinating characters, I have to admit, and their names are Sanballat, Ta Tobias, and Geshem, and he, Geshem is always associated with where he's from, Geshem the Arabian. Isn't that fascinating? Technically, it oftentimes says Tobias the Amorite, too, so we, I don't know why the Bible goes out of its way to make it clear uh, that, but these guys are purposely set up to represent something in scripture. The counselors, the evil counselors that are trying to get us to not pull off the commission of God. Nehemiah comes and returns to the land uh, of Israel and he is commissioned by God to rebuild the walls around the city of Jerusalem. And I mean, hey, just let him be, right? And yet the enemy is threatened by this, just like he is in your life. If you're considered Jerusalem or the church is considered Jerusalem, then what God wants to do is establish a wall around you. He wants to encircle you with strength. He wants to put armor plating around you spiritually so that the enemy does not have access to your city. And so, but when you start that construction process, believe me, the enemy is not happy about that. And he wants to do everything he can to sabotage the forward progression. And their names are Sanballat, Tobias, and Geshem the Arabian. They are the dupers that historically have been there. Even though these are three real characters, there's also real spiritual powers that function in the exact same way these guys were functioning in the book of Nehemiah. So I call it Operation Fortification. So the enemy has Operation Snow, or Operation Snow Job, as I'm calling it. God has Operation Fortification. All right, let's build this wall. Let's get you strong. Let's get you so that when the enemy comes in with his counsel, with his voice, that you are secure and it bounces off like, or, or uh, wipes off like water off a duck's back. In other words, it does not sink in. It does not impact you. It does not infect you. So encircling the city of Jerusalem with a wall of defense. Fortification, 
is to fortify something means to, to fill in every breach. A breach is an opening in a wall. To fortify it means to strengthen that wall, to make it so that it's a constant circle where you have a gate of entrance and that gate is locked and, the, and there's no holes in the wall. If there's a hole in the wall, the enemy's not gonna waste his time trying to bust through a gate. He's just gonna sneak through the hole in the wall. And the enemy is constantly surveying our walls to see if we have gaps. If there is cold temperature outside, and we have windows and doors in here, what should we do? We should keep the windows and the doors shut, lest the outside air come in here. You see, we're trying to temper temperature control this environment, and there is a threat if we open the window. So one of us could say, yeah, please don't open the window. And then you go over and open the window. Guess what? Then the, the, the an instant effect of that disobedience is to allow outside influence into an inner environment. And that is precisely what fortification is fighting against, is that outside influence, which is there, does not have any voice in here. And so we don't want the inside atmosphere to be controlled by outside influence. Nehemiah 2.10, this is just to get you warmed up on Nehemiah. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite officially, heard, the Ammonite official heard of it, and what did they hear of? Nehemiah rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. They were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. So you might as well get used to it, guys. The enemy is deeply disturbed <laughs> if ever you start moving forward to see your walls fortified, to see that outside influence no longer has a say in the interior of your life. Introducing the modern sand ballots. Uh-oh, guys, I'm putting a name on them. And this is like... This is exactly what is happening in the 40s uh, in this country. And I'm not saying it isn't affecting us now, but I'm not talking about now. I'm talking about the 40s and the 50s. The communists, they were the modern sand ballots. They have a design and it is not pro-America, even though they want to act like Communist USA, the party of Communist USA is pro-America. Hey, we're, we're for America. We just want to steer it directionally different in the governmental model. When in actuality, they're pro-Moscow and they wanted to change our country. They wanted to overtake our country. And that is clear now that we have the Venona cables and the, uh, interpreted and the Venona papers released in 1995, we know exactly what they were up to. And so we're going to call them the masters of spin, where they're going to take something, they're going to spin it in such a way which causes us to go, huh? Well, yeah, I guess that's fine. So one of the things, I, I gave this in my last message, uh, which was bleeding red. There are no friends. This is the mentality of the, of the Soviet Union only co-belligerents for a season. We're going to be allies with the Soviet Union in World War II against Hitler, against Mussolini, against Japan. And yet the whole while, and I'm not going to say that the Americans that we were thinking, oh, they're our dear friends, the Soviets, but we had a certain level of trust. The Soviets never had any trust towards us. The whole while they were spying on us and building what was called an apparat in our midst to actually steer us the way they wanted so here's the quote from Vladimir Lenin. We must resort to all sorts of stratagems, maneuvers, illegal methods, evasions, and subterfuge to carry on communist work. Christianity functions off of a completely different set of values. We do not, could you imagine if the Bible were to say, yes, so uh, I command all of you to have stratagems, maneuvers, illegal methods, evasions, and subterfuge to carry on Christian work. We use humility, we use love, we use kindness. Yes, we are supposed to be wise as a serpent and innocent as a dove, but we're still supposed to be innocent as a dove, even though we're supposed to be wise as a serpent. There is tactical strategy, yes, but it's ultimately to win and to give, give life, not to steal it and to take it. We are not like the thief who has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. We are like Jesus, our Savior, who has come to bring life and that more abundant. So Operation Snow, what was it? There is a character, and he's very high up in the U.S. State Department, and his name is Harry Dexter White. Now, I think the white and snow is the reason why the Soviets named it Operation Snow. That's, that's my guess, Snow White. Uh, however, it's the, the Operation Snow is to reactivate Harry Dexter White as a Soviet asset. So they've lost him as an asset. They haven't had communication with him for a while. They don't know where he stands, but they really need his position of influence. And so he's very high up in the State Department. He's shown sensitivities to the Communist Party in the past. 
not publicly, this is all privately, and the Soviets know about it, and they've had a link in the past. We don't know what that link was. There's, I don't know all. Unfortunately, when you're in spycraft, you don't give away your secrets, and so there are certain things we don't know, but there are certain things we do. So Harry Dexter White, his code name was Lawyer. He's a senior U.S. Treasury Department official. There's a picture of Harry Dexter White. Harry Dexter White is going to be exposed now after the 1995 release of the Venona Papers to be clearly a communist spy. However, he is going to live his life out with accusation against him, but without ever in incrimination. He's going to get away with it, in other words. Vitaly Pavlov, in 1939, is assigned to be a spy, spy master in the USA at the age of 25 years old. Now, that seems very young, and here's a picture of Vitaly uh, Pavlov. It's because the communists, and I said this in my past two messages, are going to have a purge in 1939. And I'm not sure, because I, I haven't really studied the purge in any depth, but Stalin is going to literally cleanse his entire system. He feels that there is... Uh, some lack of loyalty in the communist system. So he is going to uh, bring back his, all his foreign spies and he's going to kill 22,000 of them. I mean, just kill them when they came back to receive their orders. They didn't know they were coming back to be killed. And he's going to do this throughout his military ranks and everything, which is going to be one of the reasons why when Operation Barbarossa, which is the attack, the surprise attack of the Nazis against uh, the Soviet Union in 1939, 1940, is going to surprise them. They're not going to be ready for it because they've, they feel like they have peace with the Germans. So they're going to go into a purge mode to actually rid themselves and to get a new established basis of strength. Well, the Germans are going to take advantage of that and nearly wipe them out in our Operation Barbarossa. So this guy, all their foreign operatives are young guys now. So this guy is going to take over for an old guy. And so this is the one who has to pull off Operation Snow. He has to reach out to Harry Dexter White and somehow recruit him and make him a, a viable uh, operative in the system. Rifts in the encirclement. Remember we talked about uh, fortification? I'm going to call that encirclement because that's going to be one of the terms used in this. The Soviet agenda is to make sure Japan and America are at war. The Russians, when they are struck by the Germans on their, it was their Western front. Uh, but when that's happening, they're in crisis mode. The Japanese see that they can now take maybe their Eastern front and hit it. The Soviets know they can't handle a two front war. They're dying in just even a one front war in World War II. So they have to do something to make sure that Japan is occupied. So what is that plan? to get America and Japan at war. Isn't that interesting? I mean, we think about it from an American vantage point, usually, that's, that's the only vantage point we have. But international uh, intrigues are, I don't know if I wanna say they're interesting, they are interesting, they're also very sad to think of the manipulations <laughs> that go on in the world that lead to countless millions of deaths. And that's exactly what's happening here. For self-preservation, Stalin is going to implement Operation Snow to recruit Harry Dexter White to influence the State Department against and to inflame the relationships with the Japanese, where the Japanese will turn their attentions at a weakened America and lick their chops and go after that instead of Soviet Russia. And here, I'm just going to give away something. It works. I mean, it works, and that's, that's one of the things that's very sad about this. The reason I'm going to give you Nehemiah as a storyline at the same time is because Nehemiah is going to actually stiff-arm Sanballat, Tobias, and Geshem the Arabian. And I'm going to say, yeah, like that. Not like America, like that. That's exactly how we're supposed to respond to the scheming. Herbert Romerstein, from his book, The Venona Secrets, says, but in early 1941, an active agent was needed because the Soviets were concerned about Japan, which they looked upon as the eastern flank of the capitalist encirclement of the Soviet Union. An essential element of this Stalinist theory was that, at an appropriate moment, the capitalists would unite to attack Soviet Russia. Thus, the Soviet goal was to create rifts in the encirclement. That's just the enemy, to create rifts in the encirclement. He's looking to create breaches. That's what the Bible calls them. Holes in the wall, gaps in the wall. Ironically, an intercessor is a gap filler. 
That's, that's what it is. It's a, it's a term in, in regards to fortification. Intercession is actually a word to describe someone who stands in a gap when it's open to help that city rebuild its wall while it's, it's needing to hold off an enemy. Jesus is our chief intercessor. So he is going to stand in the gap and create an avenue through which we can become strong. The goal of Operation Snow, to influence the U.S. State Department to unwittingly turn Japan's gaze from a war with the Soviet Union to a war with the U.S. Now, to be honest, in just looking at this from the outside, I'm thinking, how in the world could the Soviet Union pull that off? And the key is they don't have any ability to do it, you know, with Stalin, go, you know, talking to Franklin Roosevelt going, yeah, could you guys go into a war with Japan to help us out? That's not how it's done. It's done surreptitiously, clandestinely. You see, Soviet Union has an apparat in America that we don't know about at the time. And they have deeply embedded workers uh, and that are in a position and they take their orders directly from Moscow. Whatever Moscow asks them to do, they will do it. That is what we were talking about in the last one. When you're bleeding red, that means your brain is no longer your own. Moscow is your brain. And they will do exactly as they're asked. And Harry Dexter White is their key operative because he's in a position to actually influence this. Herbert Romerstein says this, Soviet officials knew that important officials in the U.S. government wanted a modus vivendi, which is a peace treaty, basically, with Japan in order to gain time to prepare for the coming confrontation. America's peacetime army was woefully unprepared for war in 1939-1940. The draft had not been passed by Congress until September 1940, and large-scale war production, ships, planes, guns, was barely beyond the planning stages. The Japanese could view this as an invitation for an early knockout strike, as they eventually did, or they could consider it a gift of time to concentrate on their immense Western front, which included how to drive the Soviet Union out of the Far East. Already in 1938 and 1939, there had been skirmishes on the Manchurian border between Soviet and Japanese forces. So it could go either way, and the, and the Soviets feel that. They feel that at any time, the Japanese could actually strike them, but if they could encourage the Japanese to look at America as unprepared, and if they were ever going to take the Pacific theater, this would be the time. And so that's, of course, the Soviet agenda in this. It's not a pro-American agenda. It's a pro-Soviet agenda. Richard Sorge, who was a Russian spy hidden in the Nazi regime. This is, it's so interesting post-war, like in history when things are revealed. We actually have the report of a Nazi spy Who's a, I'm sorry, he's a Russian spy in the Nazi regime, and this is October 1941, and this is what he is going to report to Moscow. Japan will attack America and England. The danger to the Soviet Union is over. So this, isn't that just a fascinating thing? It's like they know that they need Japan to turn their attentions. The Stalin spin. I'm going to call it truth is defined by an agenda. So the Soviets have their truth, but it's like completely based on their agenda. It has nothing to do with truth. This is what Joseph Stalin says. This is what he's going to release through their Moscow communications, okay, to all the operatives around the world. It was not Germany who attacked France and England, but France and England who attacked Germany, assuming responsibility for the present war. Now, why would he say that? Well, at the time, he was in a peace treaty, a pact with Germany. And so he's trying to make it look like he is the good guy siding with Hitler because all of his operatives are very anti-fascist. They're anti-Hitler. So he's trying to make it look as if what he's doing is the good deed. When in actuality, if you've studied World War II, uh, you know that it was not France and England that are doing the bad deeds. It is Germany that is taking the territory throughout Europe. And they are giving plenty of ultimatums and giving him opportunity to correct his uh, wayward ways, and he is not doing it. So bringing White on board. So Harry Dexter White, how do you get him on board? Here's what we know now. We're able to put the, the picture together in a very unique way because we have Vitaly Pavlov's memoirs and we have the Venona papers. So Herbert Romerstein says this, Pavlov was concerned not only with the reputation of the Soviet Union in anti-Nazi circles, but specifically about the views of one individual, Harry Dexter White. 
Pavlov had been, had been dispatched to Washington in May 1941 to activate this agent of influence. Officially a Soviet diplomatic courier, he became the point man for Operation Snow, the major effort to manipulate U.S. Strat strategic policy through Harry Dexter White. A second NKVD, that's the foreign uh, communist work in America, officer went with him to provide security. Not knowing that White's devotion to the Soviet Union was that of a true believer, Pavlov approached White in the last months of the Nazi-Soviet pact with some uncertainty. But Pavlov quickly realized that the grotesque deal between the two despotisms had not shaken the faith of the Treasury Department official. So I, I mentioned in the last episode, but when Hitler and Stalin are going to enter into a peace treaty, that is a huge threat to many communists because communists, one of their main reasons why they joined the communist party was anti-Hitler. And they felt like what the Soviets represented was peace, was goodness to mankind and all these things. And what Hitler represented was pure evil. So when Stalin is going to unite with them, are, that's, that's one of the reasons why you're going to see the purge. If the, it, Stalin's going to feel the insecurity and he's going to want to get rid of any disloyalties. They don't know where white stands. And they're going to find out that he is a true believer, which means it doesn't matter. Whatever Moscow does is correct. Herbert Romerstein continues. He says, Pavlov phoned White in Washington in late May 1941 and made a date for lunch at a restaurant known to White from previous meetings with his NKVD handler. Pavlov recalled in his memoirs that he had told White to recognize him by his blonde hair and a copy of the New Yorker magazine that he would be carrying. Still worried that White might have become disenchanted by the Nazi-Soviet pact, Pavlov was prepared to give White a copy of an old Soviet anti-Japanese forgery called the Tanaka Memorial, if he were reluctant to push the anti-Japanese policies. But this proved unnecessary. White was quite willing to go along with the plan. At the restaurant, Pavlov handed White a note outlining themes that he wanted White to promote in the high councils of American foreign policy. Among these was a firm demand that Japan stop its aggression and recall its armed forces from China and Manchuria, and further that Japan sell a large part of its armaments to the United States. These demands in themselves utterly excessive from the Japan Japanese point of view were written in extremely harsh language, obviously designed to antagonize the Japanese. According to Pavlov's recollection many years later, White tried to put the paper in his pocket, but the Russians stopped him and made him memorize it. Doesn't that sound like a good spy story right there? No, you have to memorize it. So he's given him very specific language. So Pavlov is passing on Moscow's language to White and we want you to command the Japanese, as the American government, to command the Japanese to stop their movement into Soviet Russia, into Manchuria, into the east. And also, we want you to sell us half of your armaments, your ships, and, and all of that. Now, just imagine how the Japanese are going to hear something like that. It's like, you've got to be kidding. So this isn't wise for the Americans to do, especially if the Americans want peace, which they do. They want peace with the Japanese so they can build up their military resources as well. They don't want to antagonize, and yet this language is going to be passed from Moscow to Pavlov, Pavlov to Harry Dexter White. Now Harry Dexter White has memorized it, and so now what does he do with it? Herbert Romerstein says this, right, White wrote a memorandum shortly after this meeting and sent it to, the secret, to Secretary uh, of State. I don't know why it says, I think it's just, just this is how it's written, to Secretary Henry Morgenthau. In substance, it was an exact repetition of the points Pavlov had given him. Soviet agents in the government, as noted, were concerned that if Japan did not go to war with the United States, it might go to war with the Soviet Union. The last thing Stalin needed was for Japan to open a second front in the Soviet Far East. Germany had attacked the Soviet Union in June, and as a result of Stalin's bungling and purges, the Wehrmacht had cut through the Red Army like a knife through butter and had conquered vast areas of the Soviet Union. White had already received instructions from Pavlov. White rewrote his hardline memorandum for Morgenthau, who signed it and sent it to President Roosevelt and Secretary of State Cordell Hull. So we actually have the quote from White, which came from Moscow to Pavlov to White, now has been delivered to Morgenthau, who then submits it to the President and the Secretary of State. They're actually getting this recommendation from Stalin basically straight to the, the, the president. Isn't that amazing? Hull used most of the harsh demanding language in his ultimatum to the Japanese on November 26, 1941. This is an amazing statement, guys. November 26, do you guys know when Pearl Harbor was bombed? December 7th, 1941, a day that will live in infamy. 
This is November 26th. The Japanese are going to declare war internally, not to us, on December 1st. This is going to antagonize them to the point where they know exactly what they're going to do. And this is like a quotation from Moscow to Pavlov, Pavlov to White, White to Morgenthau, Morgenthau to Hull, and then Hull to the Japanese. So Hull used most of the harsh demanding language in his ultimatum to the Japanese on November 26, 1941. It would strengthen the hand of the war party in Tokyo, which was already prepared to attack the United States. And December 1, the final order for the attack on Pearl Harbor was given. Recall that even the policymakers who understood that America could not stay out of the war did not want to rush into a war with Japan. The reason was simple. American civilian and military leaders knew the country needed time to prepare for war. We don't want war. Soviets want war. White, as a result, wants war. And... White is going to be the chief counsel, so these guys that are handing, like Secretary of State, leans on people like White to craft the language to communicate in this international diplomacy. And that language is crafted, ironically, by Moscow. I mean, that's like one of the most shocking things in our history right there that I'm, I'm explaining. Cordell Hull, who's FDR's Secretary of State, this is excerpted from his memoirs. I realized that there was very little possibility the Japanese would accept a modus vivendi. Remember, that's a peace treaty. On the other hand, if by some good chance they accepted it, three more months would have been gained for the Army's and Navy's preparations in case Japan attacked at the expiration of the temporary agreement. Herbert Romerstein says this, during the last crucial weeks before Pearl Harbor, Hull allowed Morgenthau to incorporate some of the points the Soviets had covertly given White into the State Department's communication to Tokyo. How important was this diplomatic maneuver in bringing about December 7, 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor? General George Marshall, former chief of staff and no dove, observed, had they not attacked on December 7th, had they waited, for example, until January 1st, there was a possibility that they would not have launched the attack. The effect, the, the drama of this exact moment to have this happen right now is going to change the course of history. Now, in some regards, we could even say, well, maybe it was good, right? It awakened the sleeping giant of America. You could say that. At the same time, for American interests, this wouldn't have been what we would have wanted. The cunning of Sanballat. We're going to get back to Nehemiah now, and we're going to talk about this tactic that invades, insipidly invades, and desires to steer the inner workings, the inner thoughts, even the words that are spoken out of those that have no interest in actually speaking something from the kingdom of darkness, have no interest in, in, in saying something that would actually harm the people around me. And yet how oftentimes, even in our relationships with one another, we can use the same quotations from the devil and he's going to bring them from Moscow to Pavlov, Pavlov to White, White to Morgenthau, Morgenthau to Hull, and Hull to the Japanese. And we're going to actually be delivering something that does not come from heaven, but comes from hell in and through our own tongue. The cunning of Sanballat. So I'm just going to go through uh, a, an overview of Nehemiah in regards to Sanballat and his response. When Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite, official, uh, the Ammonite official heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. That's Nehemiah 2.10. Then Nehemiah 2.19 says, when Sanballat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard of it, they laughed at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you were doing? Will you rebel against the king? So the mockery that comes from hell when we choose to even move forward to say, no, I'm building a wall around my life. I'm going to clothe myself in the armor of King Jesus. No, I am a life that is now set apart. I belong to Jesus. I no longer belong to the powers of the devil. I'm going to have my mind renewed by the Holy Spirit so that I actually begin to think and behave with bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit and not the fruit of the flesh anymore. Yeah, that's my resolve. And there's the enemy's response. They laughed at us and despised us. Nehemiah 4.1, but it so happened when Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. Nehemiah 4.7, now it happened when Sanballat, Tobias, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, that they became very angry. Now it happened, this is Nehemiah 6, 1 through 2. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks in it, though at that time I had not hung the doors and the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, come, 
Let us meet together among the villages in the plains of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. They want to bring him outside of the city. Meet with us out here. But they thought to do me harm. Nehemiah 6, 5. Then Sanballat sent his servants to me as before the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. Why an open letter? Because an open letter brings accusation that is meant for one person, but it needs to be handed person to person. It's open, which means it can be read, and then it can, and the false information or the fake news can be dissipated. Nehemiah 6.12, then I perceived that God had not sent him at all, but that he pronounced his prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. That's this one prophet is going to come to Nehemiah and say, run for your life, hide yourself in the temple, they are coming to get you. And yet he's going to say, no, he was actually hired to bring fear in my life. And that's what this next one says. Nehemiah 6.14, my God, remember Tobiah and Sanballat, according to these, their works and the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who would have made me afraid. And finally, Nehemiah 13.28, and one of the sons of Joiada, the son of Elashib, the high priest, was a son-in-law of Sanballat the Horonite. Therefore, I drove him from me. I like that statement. It's like even the son-in-law of these lies, even the, der the derivatives, those things that come from them. If it's related to Sanballat, no, I am not accepting that in my life. So at Ellerslie, we've taught about the nine lies. Uh, we, we talk about these, there's going to be nine specific tactics and lies that Sanballat, Tobias, and Geshem are going to deliver to Nehemiah. So I'm going to just expose them and just read them out because these are the very same lies that the enemy uses today, which shows you something pretty incredible. And that is that it's been, what, 6,000 years close to since the serpent, uh, you know, was cursed that, and he was lying to Eve. We have a liar and a deceiver, but he's obviously not very creative because he says the same exact things to us all those years later. So I'm calling this the ancient art of international sabotage. Because that's what this is. These guys are foreigners. They do not want the Jewish kingdom to be reestablished. Any more than Stalin wants America to be strong, Japan to be strong, or Germany to be strong, Great Britain. Stalin is interested in Stalin. And the enemy wants his kingdom to be established, even though he wants us to make it seem like he's caring for us. Oh, no, I, I'm, I'm really interested in your well-being. Lie number one, it is impossible. The wall can never be built. Now, start out, you're a Christian and you desire to live a different life. The word of God is going to say, greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. What is the enemy gonna say though? So it depends on what you're gonna listen to. He's gonna say it's impossible. There's no such thing as a fortified life. You're always going to be my dinner on my dinner menu. You cannot get away from that. And that's the key of how and what you believe. Do you believe the enemy or do you believe the, God, the, the word of God? Line number two, you are too weak after all. You don't realize that you are in captivity. You are not able to undertake such a project as this. It is foolish, scornful, and ridiculous. If you were to translate that into your own native tongue, in your own circumstances, you'd realize the same lie is very prevalent in your own life. Line number three, all this work is for nothing. The progress you have made is not real. There is no real strength in your wall. Even the slightest breeze from the enemy will knock it down. You cannot take the rubbish of your inner life and expect to revive what has already been burned. So what do you, do you actually think that this is strength? You know, you think you're growing strong. You think you're maturing. And one of the statements that Sandbelt says is even a fox could knock down that wall. What he's trying to do is mock the working of grace in our life and make it sound like it's weak. The question is, do you believe that? Because some of you who have had summer camp highs and you've had your moments where, yeah, even a fox could knock down that, that ridiculous, it was just a bunch of emotion over here. God is doing a real work in us and it is stout and it is able to stand against the best the enemy can bring. However, the enemy is going to do his best to get you to question that. Line number four, you are too tired to continue. You need your sleep. God knows you need your sleep. You ever had that one where it's just like, go to sleep. <laughs> you are so tired. Boy, are those big bags under your eyes? Oh, wow, you look really tired. And you're like, yeah, I am sort of tired. Line number five, I have the power to sneak up, up upon you when you least expect it and wipe out everything you have done. All the spiritual steps you have taken will mean nothing when I come in the night to slay you. The devil tries to make it sound like he has the upper hand, even though it looks like God's getting some good work done. At any time that he wants, he could destroy it. Is that true? No, it is not true. 
God is in control of your life. You are purchased by his shed blood. You do not belong to the enemy. The enemy cannot just do whatever he wishes with your life. Line number six, you are currently under enemy siege. You'd better stop working and protect yourself. Line number seven, you are building this wall for your own blessing, to be your own king, to rule for your own glory. You should stop working on such a vain self-aggrandizing project. Why are you doing what you're doing? You're doing this to be seen, to be noticed. Here you are working with people that are not that easy to work with. You're pouring out your life, you're sacrificing, but then the enemy says, he questions your motives. And he wants to say, you're doing this so that you could be seen, so you could be liked. You're trying to make up for some hole or some gap in your soul. You're like, am I? And you start to turn inward to self-examine. That's the enemy's game. Whatever he's doing, his game is to get you off course. He is an evil counselor. Lie number eight Meet me for coffee in Ono. You know, let, let's, let's leave this, this city. You, you got this whole thing going. I, I realized maybe I was wrong. Maybe, maybe we should just talk and come up with some sort of agreement amongst each other. I'm concerned for your well-being, and I might be of some help in your current endeavors. I know of things that you aren't privy to know. If you listen to my counsel, it will make your work go a lot smoother. Hey, come on. Leave the safe confines of the armor of God. Come, meet with me. I can give you some good counsel, some good worldly counsel. Lie number nine, you need to consider your own protection. I know of dangerous things that loom on the horizon. Large enemy forces are gathering together to come against you. Go and hide. For if you don't concern yourself with your own safety soon, it might be too late. Listen to my counsel and you just might escape this whole matter alive. So guys, I'm going to give you uh, the rule of thumb. Reject the underminer. The enemy is an underminer and he is seeking to undermine your foundation your foundation of truth, your foundation of confidence in Jesus Christ, which is your faith. We build upon rock as Christians, and that rock is the word of God. And the, and the enemy is always questioning, implying doubt to the word of God. So our job is to reject him and to drive him from us. James 4, 7 gives us the recipe. We're supposed to submit to God, and then we're supposed to resist the devil. And when we do, he has no ability to stay. He must flee. And that is the word of God on the matter. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. James 4, 7. So the historic dangers of harboring saboteurs. Did we learn anything from this experience of the Red Scare in the 1940s? You see, we are going to harbor saboteurs. And our challenge is, because we are going to make this a political issue, we are not going to be able to solve the problem. And I would say the same is true with today. When we make these things political issues, you will find, and we've watched it over the past, it doesn't matter what political end conclusion one side has, the other side has to take the opposite. And so even if it was a good thing that we could all agree on, we can't agree. We have to stand against lest we empower the foe. And so political persuasion, when these things that are very moral, that are deeply spiritual in our country, communism is not a neutered idea. It doesn't just come into your environment and just sort of hang out, sort of like there's multiple ways that you could discipline a child. You know, you could stick them in the corner. You could give them a timeout. You could remove their toys from them. My mom used to remove sugar from my brother. Uh, you could give them corporal punishment and a little slap on the backside, right? There's all sorts of ways and you could say, all right, we could agree to disagree, but we could all agree that we want to be godly parents, right? And we want to train up our children in the way they should go in the fear and the admonition of the Lord, right? You could have differences, but this isn't one of those sorts of differences. This isn't like, oh, uh, you know, I want to stick my child in the corner and give them a time out instead of corporal punishment. That's not the sort of difference we're talking about. We're talking a complete worldview shift. Communism is anti-Christ. And you could say, whoa, that sounds pretty extreme. It is. It is anti-God, which means it's anti-Christ. It's anti-Scripture. It's anti the authority of God. So therefore, it has a deeply spiritual impact upon anyone who chooses to ally themselves with it. When you throw out God as the defining element of truth and righteousness and wholeness and even government, you have a completely different lens that is now being set upon your face. So when you look at any circumstance in life, you're going to come to a conclusion that is opposite the word of God because the word of God is the lens of Christ first. You're going to put on the glasses of Christ. How does this impact Christ? How does this showcase Christ? As opposed to how do I diminish Christ? How do I get Christ out of a culture? How do I get Christ out of my life? Very different end conclusions. 
So when we harbor saboteurs, what happens? Herbert Romerstein describes it this way. Elizabeth Bentley told the FBI in 1945 that Harry Dexter White was a Soviet agent. And the FBI in turn reported this to President Truman. But White, Harry Dexter White, was not interviewed by the FBI until August 15th, 1947. White is going to be promoted in 1946. He was, Truman was told in 1945 that Harry Dexter White has been accused of being a Soviet spy. He is going to be promoted in 1946 and he's going to become the executive director of the International Monetary Fund. Herbert Romerstein says it this way, President Truman, of course, did not support retaining communist agents in government. After all, it was he who instituted the loyalty and security program. But he did not want the image of his administration and that of the New Deal to be damaged should the Republicans make a political issue of communists in government. Truman, by not firing White in 1946, denied the Republicans a public example of a high-level Soviet agent in the government. And as a result, a high-level Soviet agent was in the government and influenced American policy. So I'll just give, this is just one illustration, okay? This is just one guy. I mean, Elizabeth Bentley is going to name 80 different government officials that are high up. She's going to name them. And they, if you guys remember my, my message, The Blonde Spy Queen, because of a leak in the system, Kim Philby, who's uh, one of the head guys at MI6, is going to leak it back to Moscow, and Moscow is going to shut down any connection that they have with Elizabeth Bentley is going to go silent. So everything she's going to say, just watch this person. They'll go into this store. They'll do this. Every single one of those things is going to come up dry. Why? Because they're on to them. And so Elizabeth Bentley is going to look like a liar. And I mean, this is all part of the massive intrigue that is taking place. And this guy is going to get away with it. So let's look at the impact of just this one man's use for the Soviets. The Allied currency printing plates were secreted from White to Bentley to the USSR. The Soviets printed upwards of $250 million in unsubstantiated, unbacked currency, robbing directly from the American treasury. And that's just a guess at how much uh, they got. White strongly encouraged a $5 billion loan to the USSR, to the Soviets. Uh, when White was promoted to assistant secretary of the treasury, he placed another Soviet spy, Harold Glasser, in his old position. So when he moved up, he replaced himself with another Soviet spy. White helped author the economic plan for post-war Germany, which greatly hindered Germany. Now, why would you want to hinder Germany? If you're pro-Russia or pro-Soviet Union, you want to make sure that the Soviet Union is secure and, and Germany is their greatest threat. Then what did White do after he creates the language for, this, uh, for the post-war economic plan for Germany? Then he leaks this information creating a backlash amongst post-war Germans toward the U.S. and Great Britain, with the Soviets appearing to be the ones set on a gentler approach known as soft peace, which turned out to be anything but soft. White was the chief American delegate to the post-war economic summit. He's one of our main decision makers post-war America. And this is something we even know that he's there, but we're unwilling to remove him for political reasons. The ramifications of this are actually very significant that it's hard to follow, but because we never were able to expose a high-level government person that is clearly a, a communist spy, it is always considered innuendo and false. It's like it was all hyperbolized, and we really didn't have a problem. And that's part of the challenge that we're going to run into when Joseph McCarthy, in one of my upcoming messages, is going to sort of handle it in a rather crusading way and it's going to turn the country against this red scare, this anti-communism routine, because it seems to be hollow and empty. It's overstated is the concept. Meanwhile, it's sort of like saying in our Christian life, the enemy's work of sin is overstated. It's really not that bad. I don't know. I mean, when people say that you go to hell when you die, I don't know that it's that extreme. It's like a diminishment of something that is actually deadly to our nation. It's going to cost us greatly as a nation. It's still infecting us as a nation, but you can't really address it anymore. We've sort of lost our voice in this because of so many things that are happening here. There's a statement in 2 Corinthians that we are not ignorant of his devices, which means the enemy's devices or the devil's devices, or Satan specifically here. Now, whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed... 
I have forgiven anything. I've forgiven that one, that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Why does Paul forgive? Paul knows that forgiveness is, a door, is an open door sin. So if you are harmed or grieved or there's a trauma that comes to your life because of another party and you don't forgive, that opens up a door of access for the enemy. It's like opening a window or a door. It, it messes with your encirclement of defense. And so Paul is going to say, hey, look, we, we do forgive. Why? Because we are not ignorant. It says, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We understand how this battle works. So we're not playing his game. And I always make the comment when I hear that, that I'm not exactly so sure that I could say the modern church is not ignorant of Satan's devices. I think we are very ignorant of the enemy's devices. We don't know how the war works. We're being duped at a very high level in our state department, and we have voices that we have allowed in to counsel us in how we are dealing with our antagonists. And the enemy wants us to engage in a warfare. He wants us to engage in a warfare denominationally, and he's feeding us his lines to create the rifts. He wants to have us engage in a warfare in our families, in our marriages. He is feeding us lines to actually egg us on to create division. And because if we're divided, he's not threatened. He's trying to take away that danger of an Eastern front war on his front. We need to actually hit him on his Eastern front is what we need to do. Instead of spending our time fighting our in battles within the church, and within our families, most of us are spending 99% of our energies and our life trying to stay afloat as opposed to turning outward and beginning to change this world for Jesus Christ. We spend most of our energies, and when, when I say 99%, I'm being generous because it's more like 99.9999999% of our life that we are spent in survival mode because the enemy is counseling us. And we need to close that off and we need to fortify our walls. Leslie and I went through a season of an operation fortification in our life where it's like, God, show us any breaches in our life. And we literally spent days just with a list in front of us. And if there was anything that was allowing the enemy access, a voice into our life, we wanted him to show it to us. And then we spent a long period of our life, a couple months where we were literally praying that each of those be sealed up and that those be repaired by the spirit of God. If there's a step of obedience, if there's a step of reparation we need to make, then we're going to do it because we want our life to be secure. We're being played by the enemy and I do not want to be played by the enemy. So guys, final statement, put on that armor. Clothe yourself in what Jesus Christ has given you. He has given you himself as a shield. He's given you himself as a belt, his, himself as a breastplate, himself as a helmet. It's the life of Christ. And as we wear that, we wear that with integrity and intentionality. The enemy has nothing on us. We do not need to fear Pavlov, or I should say Moscow unto Pavlov, Pavlov unto White, White unto Morgenthau, Morgenthau unto Hull, and Hull unto us. That isn't what we need to fear. It's like, oh, the enemy's going to get us. That's what the devil's trying to say. Even a fox could knock down this wall of yours. You have no defense against the enemy. He's going to get you. He's going to eat you for dinner. I am in Christ Jesus by faith. And there is nothing that can get through Christ. Nothing. It says the shield of faith repels all the fiery darts of the enemy. All means all. I do not fear what the enemy has assigned against me. The enemy should fear what I represent. I am a child of the Most High God, sealed, preserved, guarded, and fortified in the shed blood of Jesus. If there's anyone that needs to be fearing, it should be the enemy. And that is Christianity. Father, we ask that you would bring us into an operation fortification in our own lives and that we would be made strong to fight these battles, that we would be wise for battle and that we would not be ignorant of the enemy's devices. If we have open windows and open doors and outside temperatures and outside climate are getting into our interior, I pray that you would put your finger on those things and gently correct us and lead us towards a place of health and strength. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.